Since governments of all natures claim for themselves the exclusive use of violence, police, army, death penalty, as the ultimate exercise of their authority, nonviolence challenges both the power and the righteousness supporting any government. Jesus and the early Christians are often described as the first outspoken believers in nonviolence. In his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus set forth the underlying idea of nonviolence. Loving your neighbors is not enough. You must also love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. The last years of his life are a rich example of how to live this life in the face of danger and opposition. In the three centuries after Jesus forgave the men who crucified him, Christianity was an illegal, outcast religion, preaching such radical ideas as equality and nonviolence. History's first recorded conscientious objector was a Christian living in North Africa in A.D. 274. Maximilianus, a Roman soldier, said that the teachings of Jesus forbade him to kill, so he was killed for refusing to kill. As the Christian Church became more established and supported by government, it tempered its teachings about violence. Soon, it started to give God's blessing to the Emperor's wars. While Maximilianus ultimately became a saint, other theologians, starting with St. Augustine in the 5th century, developed a doctrine of just war, an increasingly convoluted mental exercise to explain why Jesus would support killing particular people. Other Christian voices, such as St. Francis, reached for a more positive, active definition of what was good. Sadly, in the last 1700 years, Many millions have died in wars fought between different groups of Christians, all of whom recognized the Ten Commandments. The idea of nonviolence was first articulated by Hinduism using the word ahimsa. It was important not to inflict suffering upon other beings. Hinduism's support of vegetarianism, for example, comes from this idea. As a check on violence among humans, however, Hindu teachings were ambiguous, including the worship of warlike gods like Indra. Ancient Jewish teachers recognized the virtue of nonviolence. Moses brought down God's commandments, including, Thou shalt not kill. Isaiah described the kingdom of the Lord as where, They shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. Rabbi Hillel, a contemporary of Jesus, taught, What is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow. Buddhism is focused on reducing suffering for oneself and others. Buddhist doctrine is more explicitly nonviolent than most other religions, but it has never been a dominant and pervasive political force. Few people have been killed in the name of Buddhism, but neither have they been spared. The Buddha's advice anticipated Jesus's. Islam contains the root word salam, peace in Arabic. The Quran speaks of Allah leading people to the path of peace, out of the darkness and into the light. Muhammad imposed a complete ban on violence in Islam's early days in Mecca. Yet, as Islam spread after 622, and was attacked by non-believers, it took a different view of violence. Many surahs in the Quran extol violence as a way to do Allah's will. As with Christianity, once Islam became a part of the powerful movement, violence stopped being a sin and became a tool. Just as Christianity brought us crusades, Islam brought us jihad. Several reform traditions in Christianity in the 15 and 1600s were motivated by the desire to return to the simplicity and purity of early Christianity. Some of these groups remain actively committed to peace and nonviolence, notably 
the Mennonites, Brethren, and Quakers. In the mid-1600s, George Fox taught Quakers to seek that of God in each person. Quakers, thus, naturally reject all forms of violence as a tax upon a part of God or God's creation. As friends proclaimed to the king in 1660, we so testify to the world that the Spirit of Christ, which leads us into all truth, will never move us to fight and war against any man with outward weapons, neither for the kingdom of Christ nor for the kingdoms of this world. In England, friends were regularly persecuted and prosecuted as a threat to the church and the crown. In 1656, the first Quakers arrived in the English colonies in America. By 1658, four Quakers had been executed and many expelled from the Puritan colonies of New England. The founding of Pennsylvania in the 1680s provided the relatively unusual opportunity to see what a government committed to equality, individual freedom, and most peculiarly, nonviolence would be like. William Penn called it a holy experiment. For 70 years, the colony thrived, attracting religious dissenters and other free thinkers from all over Europe and America. Philadelphia grew to be the most important city in the Americas. Relations with the Native Americans were handled in an open, honest, and peaceful way. Land was bought and agreements were kept. The colony flourished in the peace that ensued. In 1756, in the face of the French and Indian War, the Quakers in the Provincial Assembly resigned their offices. This ended its commitment to pacifism. One Quaker even wondered whether to govern is absolutely repugnant to the avowed principles of Quakerism. Quaker influence was not gone, however. Quakerism's peace testimony and commitment to speaking the truth to power was the spark to the growing movement to abolish slavery. In 1780, Pennsylvania became the first state to abolish slavery. This was the first victory in a series of nonviolent campaigns, not just to end slavery, but also to promote women's rights, public education, and the humane treatment of prisoners. The most articulate champion of nonviolence in the time between Jesus and Gandhi was Henry David Thoreau. He wrote in 1849 that under a government which imprisons any unjustly, the true place for a just man is also a prison. Cast your whole vote, not a strip of paper merely, but your whole influence. A minority is powerless while it conforms, but it is irresistible when it clogs by its whole weight. If the alternative is to keep all just men in prison or give up war and slavery, the state will not hesitate which to choose. World War I was called the war to end all wars, yet the century that followed was more deadly than all the previous centuries combined. As Martin Luther King Jr. would later say, wars are poor chisels for carving out peaceful tomorrows. A better strategy is to take care of those in need, even if they have been our enemies, selflessly bringing relief and comfort to the desperate and dispossessed on both sides of the conflict after both world wars the Friends Service Committees of the U.S. and Britain paved the way for the successful reconstruction of Europe and arguably the longest period of peace in its history. For their efforts, they were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1947. World War II is often described as a just war. In hindsight, no one can argue with putting an end to the Holocaust protecting the millions who were slaughtered surely would have been a just cause. But that was not what happened. The Allies learned about the genocide during the war, but did not reveal any details until after the war. No Allied soldier fought for this cause. While we bombed German cities and civilians, we left untouched the machinery of death in the concentration camps. It was in the 20th century, the century that saw the development of impersonal, indiscriminate, and cataclysmic weapons and leaders willing to use them, when nonviolence began to prove itself on a recurring and worldwide basis. Mohandas Gandhi, inspired by Jesus, Thoreau, and the Hindu idea of Ahimsa, argued that India would never end British colonial rule by force. 
Instead of bullets, Indians needed to use their moral power. With a long series of nonviolent challenges to colonial rule, Gandhi demonstrated to the British that Indians were willing to die, but not to kill, in order to reclaim their country. When the frustrated British responded with violence, the world saw the moral superiority of the nonviolent Indians and the emptiness of the British claim to be a civilizing influence upon its colony. It was only a matter of time then before Britain recognized the inevitable and in 1947 granted independence to a country that had already claimed it. Gandhi's tactics and success did not go unnoticed in the U.S. The civil rights movement used a combination of legal challenges and peaceful civil disobedience to highlight and confront unjust laws. In 1947, when the first Freedom Riders, a group of white and black men, rode interstate buses down into the southern states, they broke laws that separated public facilities by race. They also inspired retaliatory violence from white racists and law enforcement officers. This set a pattern that would be followed throughout the South challenging the so-called Jim Crow laws set up after the Civil War to preserve white domination. In state after state, blacks and whites together challenged unjust laws that affected education, public accommodations, real estate, marriage, voting rights, and economic opportunity. One of the clearest voices explaining how and why this nonviolent movement would prevail was Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., who declared, Nonviolence is never an end within itself. It is merely a means to awaken a sense of shame within the oppressor. But the end is reconciliation. The end is redemption. The demonstrator agrees that it is better for him to suffer publicly for a short time to end, for example, the crippling evil of school segregation than to have generation after generation of children suffer in ignorance. The nonviolent strategy has been to dramatize the evils of our society in such a way that pressure is brought to bear against those evils by the forces of goodwill in the community and change is produced. We who engage in nonviolent direct action are not the creators of tension. We merely bring to the surface the hidden tension that is already alive. With its success in India and the American South, nonviolence as a principle and a strategy became widely adopted around the world. In the U.S., the United Farm Workers led by Cesar Chavez used marches, boycotts, strikes, fasts, and publicity to win better wages and safer working conditions for Latino farm workers. The environmental and feminist movements dramatized the need for change in protests on both local and national levels leading to great gains. Anti-war groups have regularly protested peacefully and committed civil disobedience to highlight the dangers of war, though sadly with less success than other progressive groups. By the 1980s and 90s, activists around the world had used nonviolence to help bring down apartheid in South Africa, dictatorships in Argentina, the Philippines and Yugoslavia, and many of the Soviet-style governments in Eastern Europe. The lesson we should draw from this is that nonviolence is a practical means of resolving conflicts, not just an idealistic dream. Still, wars and areas of vast conflict continue where disputes have not been peacefully resolved. As Dr. King said, the end of violence, or the aftermath of violence, is bitterness. The aftermath of nonviolence is reconciliation and the creation of a beloved community. I'm
Study one or more. 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 Study one or